So let's start. This talk will be a, a little bit different because we are usually talking about design topics. We are usually go talking about developers' topics. But I would like to talk about users today because in the design process, we have designer, developer, and the client, and we sometimes forget about our users. But before I begin, a couple of things for those who don't know me. This is my son, Luca, and my biggest job in my life is being a father. And we have a lot of time, a lot of fun times. This time we were at Vienna. And as, he, as you can see, he is very happy driving these little cars. But to pay for all this, I have to work. And I'm fortunate enough that I could work with something that I really love, and this is being a designer. And on this picture, you can see me and my brother, Lucian. We have an agency called Blagonich Brothers. And we have been working together for the past five years. And before that even, for the past 13 years, I worked with a lot of clients. And in that period, I finished more than 500 different projects. So something that I learned in that period of time, in these 13 years of working with Croatian and foreign clients, I'll try to tell you in this presentation today. But before, we dis before I start with that talk, I would like to tell you a story. And this is a story of Atari. And I don't know how many gamers are in the audience, so can, could you raise, raise your hands? Cool. Great. <coughs> so in 1983, Atari published a video game called E.T. So, so some of you might know that. And E.T. was often considered the worst game of all time, although it has been sold in more than a million copies. But at the end, 500,000 of unsold cartridges were buried in the desert, alongside with the Pac-Man and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. So, what, what is the problem there? What is the problem? The problem is they never realized what the users want, what the players want. And they published a game for the one sole reason. They wanted money, they were really greedy, and they failed. And what did the game industry learn from all this? What do you think? Here's what I think. They learned probably nothing because even today we have video games that are crap, that aren't played by anyone. Because if we, you think only about money and you are greedy enough, you will create video games that no one wants to play. So this is a game industry, but we learned something from that, and this is that we should never underestimate our users. Because when we, because when we build something, we don't build it for ourselves. We are building that for our users. And I will try to tell this story today with two different perspectives. The first one is a designer perspective. And the second one is the client perspective. So what do we want as a designer from our users? What do we think of them? Well, first of all, we love them. We want them to be as happy as possible when surfing our website or using our software or our product. We really care about them. We want them to stay on our website for as much as they can. We want them to buy stuff on our website, buy products. And to make this happen, we want them to have a really fast website experience. <coughs> we don't want our website to load forever. And of course, we want to have a really good experience on mobile devices because 50% of our users, of visitors of our, of our websites, will come from their mobile devices, mobile phones or tablets. So we should think about them as well. And last but not least, we should think about readability and usability of everything. Because if a person comes to your website and cannot see things clearly because of not good enough contrast or fonts that are not good enough, then you have a problem. And this is all true in theory, but is this really what we all want? Because it makes sense, we want our users to be happy, to feel good when they're surfing our website. But here's what I think. We say that we love our users, but we use techniques that are wrong. And these two things I hate the most on the websites. And you can clap if you, you do too. 
So why is scroll hijacking wrong? Because when you surf a website, you usually use your normal mouse and you scroll normally. And scroll hijacking is making this different. So when you surf a website that has a hijacked scroll, you have a problem. You don't understand everything. You don't understand what happened because something is wrong. Something is other than normal. And the same goes with parallax effects, but with one other twist. Because, because when you use a lot of parallax effects in your websites, it might look cool on your computer that is the last generation computer and on the last generation mobile phone or a tablet. But what with all those users that don't have the last generation computer? What about them? So I think that these two things, when used on a website, a kitten dies after that. And if you like kittens, you shouldn't never try this. And yes, we say that we want them to have a really fast website experience, but then we use a lot of assets. We don't optimize those assets. And I don't mean by optimizing only minifying JavaScript or CSS. This is the first thing you can do. But the be better thing to do is <coughs> to think, to think about all the assets that you're using on your website. For example, how many web fonts do you use? Do you really need a web font for a small button on your website? Do you really need those 100 kilobytes that will be downloading more and more on your website? In fact, it's not the, the, the right question to ask, do we need it, but do our users need it? Because they will use your website. And yes, we want them to surf on their mobile phones. That makes perfect sense. But even today, you will see websites that are not designed with that in mind. We didn't design a non-responsive website for years. And most of the better agencies here in Zagreb or everywhere in the world won't design a website that's not responsive or even mobile. But a lot of them do. And what happens then? For example, a couple of months ago, I was traveling and I wanted to add some funds to my ENC account because I was stuck somewhere in the middle and I had to refund to use my ENC card reader. And what happened? Of course, I start, stopped at the gas station and I wanted to add funds. But this task was so long because I, I had to use the desktop version of a website. So this experience was painful. So think about it. Think about your users. And when you try to do something, you try to create a new website. And if a client comes to you and say, hey, I don't have a budget for a responsive website, then ask yourself if this is the job that you want to do. <coughs> and yes, we say that we think a lot about readability. But we don't use appropriate contrast or fonts. And this is especially visible when a graphic designer comes to web design. So when a graphic designer comes to web design, they usually don't understand the whole picture. Because when you are a graphic designer, you usually print something out, and it looks the same everywhere. But in the web design, we have so many variables that we have to take care of. We should think about how will the user see on their small screen, or giant screen, or on a bad LCD, or on a good LCD. So we have all these variables, and a connection as well. So when you try to design something, when you try to optimize something, think of all these all this parts when doing a design. And contrast is a simple, uh, simple example because I've seen a lot of websites that, <coughs> that use a uh, white background and uh, light gray and even on that, light font on it. And this is a big readability problem. And when a, a visitor comes to your website and he has problems, using that, using your website, using your web shop, then you have a problem and your client has a problem. But let's not talk about designers anymore. We are perfect. Let's talk about clients. And clients usually say the same, same things and, as we do. We all want, we are on the same ship. We all want the same things. But they say it a little bit differently. So they say they want more visitors and more sales. It makes sense. And they want a modern website and a fast website. And on top of all that, they want to lower their bounce rate. But do they really want that? Because it all makes sense in theory, but in practice, 
it's a different picture. It's a different movie. So when they say they want more visitors, they should be prepared to optimize the content. <coughs> and the content is key here because today we are aware that the content is probably the most important thing on the website. Not the design, not the visual effects, not the, the, the idea of using parallax effects or scroll hijacking, the content is. So I talked with a couple of people and on a conference that we organized in Rijeka uh, a month ago, there was a speaker from San Francisco and she said this, when you have a budget, 25% should go on content, 25% on a design and 35% on development. So if you think of a content, think of what will you serve to user? What will be the titles? Are the call to actions good enough for them? Is the content, are the images good enough for them? And the clients say they want more sales. Of course, we all do that. But in that matter, in that specific case, sometimes they're not focused on the right things. A lot of times clients come to us and say, I want drop shadow, I want giant images across the whole screen. But these are only visual, these are only functional. If you're creating a web shop, why the hell in the world do you need a picture across the whole screen? Well, sometimes in specific cases you do, but if you have uh, 10,000 products, you don't. The Amazon doesn't have a picture across the whole screen and the Amazon optimizes everything constantly. So in that case, I try to educate our clients because they are sometimes lost and we are, we, we, we've all been there. We've all created our first project. We sucked, probably. And we are making better things with every, every our next project. And this is my favorite. When a client comes and say, hey, I want to have a modern website. And the first thing he says is usually, I have a neighbor that has a really cool website. And when you see that, that's a five years old website. And the second best thing is when a client comes to us and say, um, Facebook has this really cool feature. Of course, it's Facebook, it has a tons, tens of dozens of developers and you probably have a small team. You don't have unlimited budget, so take care of that. And when we start working with the client, we interview them. We ask a lot sort of questions, and one of the first questions we ask is, which websites do you like? And what exactly do you like on that? Because it's not enough to say, I like, I don't know, this website or that website, but it's important to understand the client what exactly does he like? Because when you ask them what websites do you like, they will probably show you the websites from a different industry. So if they are selling car tires, you shouldn't look at the websites from, I don't know, pharmaceutical industry because the target audience isn't the same. And the business isn't the same. So my suggestion to the clients is never to look the other website, because you don't want to make a copy, you want to make something that will stand out. And this is really important. It's really important to stand out. And they say they want a fast website, but then they're not prepared to use less stuff on their website. For example, and this is something that we'll see in all, all the time. You deliver a website, and sometimes people don't understand that you should think ahead of clients. If you allow your clients to upload five megabyte images, they will do that. They will come and uh, use their camera and they will just use that JPEG and put it on the website. So if he puts five of those images on the website and you aren't optimized and he doesn't think of that, you will have a problem because five megabyte images in four sliders means 20 megabytes, and when you are on mobile phone, on the edge, how long will you wait? So I have an example here as well. A couple of days ago, I was surfing the web, and I saw a banner that said PlayStation 4 plus FIFA 16, that price. 
And I clicked on that banner. And what happened next? I waited for 10, for 20, for 30 seconds. And after that, I just closed, closed it. Because for how long would I wait anyway? So this is the example of how you can have good ideas. And you are thinking well, but the execution is not that well. And with all that in mind, how can we achieve lower bounce rate? We simply can't. Because if those things aren't set, we have a problem. If we don't think about the whole picture, if we are not thinking about optimization, if we are not thinking about the content and using the appropriate images and fonts and enough contrast, how can you achieve lower bounce rate? How can you make your visitors stay longer at your website? So think about it the next time when you start to design something. So how can we change those things with a lot of love? So I'm not saying that you should walk by the street and hug your clients, although this might help. But with a lot of love and understanding and by using these five simple words. So listen, communicate, educate, advise, and compromise. And we should all re remember that and maybe repeat it once more. So listen, communicate, educate, advise, and compromise. Because when a client comes to you, you will most certainly listen. You have to listen. You have to ask all sorts of questions. What is their short-term goals of the website, long-term goals? You, want, you have to understand everything. And of course, some of those quest questions like I asked before, uh, like, what website do you like? And what exactly do you like on that? And, of course, we should communicate all the time because from the beginning of the process to the end of the process, we should be in constant communication with the client. So this means by using Skype, using email, or some other project management tool like Basecamp or Teamwork. We should communicate all the time because with that in mind, we are helping our clients understand understand the process, and with that in mind, we help them educate everything. We are educating them. Clients are like first grade, first graders, and we are like teachers to them. When a client asks a question, no matter how stupid that question might seem, we are here to answer that question because we are the experts in the story. And be, being an expert means that we will give a lot of advices in that, in that process. Because giving advice is, is important. And this is not only a client, uh, client and designer relationship. It's a partnership and it should be a partnership. And in the end, sometimes we compromise. Because compromise is something that happens, well, not all the time, but some of the time. Because sometimes you will have a problem and you don't see a solution to that problem. And you could complicate everything. But in that case, is talk with your clients. Ask them what they think about it. And especially if it is a business problem, because you are a designer, you don't understand their business so well at some times. And here's an, another example. A couple of months ago, I was working on a user interface for a help desk software for a telecom industry. Help desk software in telecom industry sucks. And telecom industry is so big, so huge, that I needed, I don't know, 10 days to try to understand 10% of it. So I had to make a lot of compromises. I had to make a lot of talk with my client to help them understand and to help me understand. And as I said, this is a partnership and not only a business, business relation. And in the end, remember that you are the expert. We are the expert in this story. So the final question we should ask ourselves when facing a problem is do we need it? Or maybe this isn't the final question. I think that the qu final question should be do our users need it? Because we sometimes forget that we don't design the websites for ourselves, we design it for our users. So if our users cannot use that website, we did a lousy job. And when someone, I don't know, takes a job that they cannot deliver as good as they can, then 
they make the whole industry look bad. So I urge you, think again. Think again when the clients come to you and say, I don't have enough of a budget. It's better not to work on that job if they don't have a budget to do everything as it's supposed to be, as the industry standard. So do our users need it? That's the final question. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. We have a microphone, so raise your hand. Yay, one question. Hello. Uh, obviously, you have a, a large firm and uh, lots of experience with clients and uh, everything. I, we don't have a large firm. Well, we I mean, uh, well known, well known okay. firm. Yeah. So I, my question is, uh, me as a freelancer, or to, if I'm doing business for some lesser known firm, are there any tips or techniques to gain clients' trust to actually sometimes listen to you and make them... Uh, how, how long are you in the business? Well, I'm doing some projects for about two years, but I have... So you're rather new here in the business? Well, yeah, yeah. So we, are all, we have all started somewhere. We didn't all be born and having 13 years of experience. So in the, in the first, in the first place, maybe it's a good thing to do to have smaller prices. And with that, you will get a lot of new clients. And after that, you will just build a relationship with this client and all the rest of the clients. So I think that the better, best advice I can give you is to always try to achieve more. And when a client talks to you, uh, we are all experts, and we are n all not experts, actually. And this is all the thing you show up. So I, I think that the most important thing you can do at the moment is to learn all the time. So two years have passed. You have learned something in that period. And you will learn practically the whole of your career. So if you are learning, you can always uh, talk with a client as an expert. Because two years is, although it's not maybe such a long period, it's long enough that you can be the expert to the client. Maybe not all, all parts, but on some parts. So if you are, I don't know, expert in HTML and CSS, you can give the clients that advices. And if you are an expert on, I don't know, Laravel, you can give clients that advices. So I think that this is the right thing to do. I'm not sure if I answered your question, so if I'm not, you can catch me, catch me later. <laughs>